You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Welcome to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll take a deep dive into the world of volatility with in-depth analysis, trading activity reviews, strategy breakdowns, cutting-edge education, and much more. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with the traders, researchers, and asset managers who are reshaping the volatility landscape. If it involves volatility, then you'll find it on Volatility Views. And now, it's time to take a deep dive into the world of volatility. It's time for Volatility Views. All right, everybody. That music means it is Friday. It is noon central. It is 1 p.m. Eastern. Are you ready to talk some vol? Well, I hope so. Because you tuned into a vol show. Some might say the premier program for volatility traders. Yes, welcome to Volatility Views. My name, of course, Mark Longo from the T-H-E, optionsinsider.com, except no substitutes, as well as, of course, from the ever-compelling network. A lot of fun stuff coming at you this week, kicking it off with the old OB on Monday, all the way through to OB again yesterday, a little options boot camp in between, a little TWIFO in between, of course, uh, some pro Q&A action, all sorts of fun coming at you this week. Interviews, which you're going to be, you're already hearing actually on the pro side. So if you're on the pro side, you're already getting access to some of that fun stuff we did from OIC. More to come. If you want to check it out for yourselves, get early access to all this goodness. You want to come back after Vol Views for a little bit of options oddities. Only one place to get that, the optionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go. Congrats to our longtime pro member, Age Del Aquarius, who won the April Pro Trading Crate on Monday, courtesy of one Uncle Mike. All right, let's go around the horn, see who's joining us, because the clock is ticking on the show today. Listeners, first, let's go out once again to, I don't know if he's in the uh, hinterlands of Chicago or maybe down in uh, southern Indiana there at the Kelly School of Business. We are joined once again by Mr. Russell Rhodes, and we call him around here the once future and present Dr. Vix. We've had a request, a suggestion to because he's talking V-Stocks all the time now and all of his research these days is V-Stocks, to maybe amend that to Dr. V Stocks. Mr. Rhodes, welcome back to the show. What do you think about being the once future and present Dr. V Stocks? V Stocks, I like it. V2X. I'm going to get that. That's going to be my v, new license. V2X. Get it tattooed uh, right on the forearm. Got to replace, got to replace <laughs> my VIX license plate with the V2X license plate. Um, yeah, and if I cut you off and, and, and you see that Chicago White Sox VIX license plate, um, yeah, you're going too slow. That's why I cut you off. <laughs> Dr. V stocks, more syllables, but I, we might be able to make, make it work. We'll workshop about, it. Yeah. We'll workshop it. How about Dr. Vol? Dr. Vol? That also works. That's or more the, blanket. The Vol doctor, kind of like the love. There you go. The love doctor. The love, love doctor, Mr. Rhodes. And also joining us, he is not a love doctor. He is quite the curmudgeon. Uh, he is the rock lobster himself, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi, from the shores of Maine by way of Option Pit. And the reason why I say the clock is ticking, because this man, first world problems, has to go put his yacht in the water in approximately 24 minutes. So we have to get going. Mr. Mr. Rock Lobster, welcome to the show. Glad you could delay your Thurston Howell the Third boat launch. Well, it's it was my dock in the water, not the yacht. Oh, I'm sorry. The yacht comes yacht. after the dock. <laughs> Yes, the boat gets connected to the dock. Anyway, <laughs> yes, I'm here. Uh, the Clam Pirates were here this morning. Uh, 
pulling out their uh, $1,000 haul again um, because the prices of steamers are going through the roof. Um, but uh, all is all is well in the pit of options. I hope you're standing there with your shotgun demanding your 15% tariff off the top, saying, I want 15% of that 1000 bucks every time you come through. That'll pay for your dock. I, I think that's fair. That, that's, that's fair. I think that's, that's very fair. As we keep on rolling into the volatility review. It's time to break down the latest developments in the volatility trading world. It's time for the Volatility Review. All right, everyone, welcome to the Volatility Review. And I got so excited at the top of the show that I neglected to mention we do have a bonus guest holding down the Eurex hot seat for us this week. Beaming in all the way from Australia was Gary Norton, a hedge fund manager over there at NN Squared Capital, talking all sorts of volatility from an international perspective, uh, V-stocks, all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, we actually had to beam him in yesterday because <laughs> it's like one o'clock in the morning there now. Those Australians, it's hard to get them on the U.S. time sometimes. But interesting stuff, so stay tuned for that at the end of the show. It's kind of a bonus for you this week. And also because the Rock Lobster has to run to put his yacht in the water, we're going to focus domestic first. We'll, Russell and I will come back with a little international vol after this guy shuffles off to the yacht land. But what's shuffling off in the markets out there today? Well, it kind of depends where you live in, listeners. Uh, right now, if you're in the NASDAQ, it is shuffling off to the red, off about two-tenths of a percent out there right now. Uh, the S&P, again, most of them were green a little while ago, listeners. Now the NASDAQ has turned to the red. The S&P struggling to stay green right now, up slightly. It's pretty much unched on the day. We're still north of 50 to 100, 52, 15 to be precise. But we'll see if this sucking sound will suck it all down and the Dow up about a quarter of a percent. And our old friend, uh, the Russell 2000, they didn't get the memo today. They're off nearly, almost exactly a full percent out there today. So they're coming for small caps today, and they're coming for NASDAQ. Not quite coming for the rest of the market yet, but again, the day is young. In terms of vol, they're coming for that a little bit as well, but we'll see if that persists. Right now, hanging out at about a 12 and three quarters, down about exactly a point from where it was this time last week. Also interesting, VIVIX at about a 73. That's down a full point from last show as well. We're starting to get into some rarefied territory. I can't remember really the last time we saw a 73. And I had to go back and look, actually, listeners. And I also started wondering, have we ever discussed live on the show a 60 handle in VIVIX? I could not recall that off the top of my head. The answer to that is yes. We have seen one in the lifetime of this show. It was back in... May of 2014, the May 9th of 2014, to be precise. The show was running that long ago, listeners, a decade ago, believe it or not. We hit a 61.76. That's where it closed, actually. So it might have gotten lower intraday. Uh, so, yeah, we did get a low 60 handle. I don't recall discussing it that much on the show back then. It's been a while, obviously. We did break 74 ever so briefly a little over a year ago, beginning actually the very first day of trading last year, January 3rd. It was at about a 74, 73.98, I believe. And then you got to, before that, you got to go all the way back to February of 2019 to get the last time we were really kind of down in this range. So pre pandemic, you got to about a 74 and 98, just barely broke 75 back in February of 2019. So 73, that's a long way around to saying we're in some fairly rarefied territory right now. You got to go back a ways to really find a lot of data points that really come close to this. So intriguing stuff on the ball of ball front. Since Thurston Howell has to run soon, we'll let him go first. Professor. Professor is the other guy. <laughs> First, Mr. Mr. Millionaire. What, uh, what's catching your eye in the world of ball, sir? Well, I mean, kind of what you said. I mean, we've got, I mean, not very long ago, people were kind of freaking out about the world. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure, right? It was like three weeks ago. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, I, I was just going through this with my students. Like, I mean, traders, like, so one thing I was explaining to, you know, students is that for the most part, liquidity providers are just, they're constantly buyers of options because the public sells, right? They sell, they write calls, they write puts, you know, for you know, there's a myriad of trades out there, obviously, but all I know is I was a liquidity provider for 15 years and I spent a lot of time writing blue, uh, a lot of time writing brown and black tickets, um, which were buy puts and buy calls, respectively. Um, 
So, and we got the weekend coming. So there's always this kind of pressure on volatility to kind of make it lower. Um, it's, I call it like, it's like the tide coming in. <laughs> it's, it is gonna happen. So now, as soon as the market starts to move, that all changes. But today I was, I was pretty surprised that the liquidity provider, now I'm assuming, again, if I'm in the pit and this is me, I'm dropping vol as fast as I can because I'm loading up and now you have all these weeklies, so I can't even imagine what the gamma numbers look like probably for some of these guys. Um, be interesting to see just for a little fun, but um, I'm seeing like a 10 day realize and 13, 30 day realize 13 and VIX is 1276. So the full VIX calc, um, with all those little putties in them, uh, are is lower than the last ten days, lower than the last thirty. So that is a head like a tell that nobody cares about the CPI. They assume it's going to be a little hot, but whatever. Um, you know, maybe the interest rate thing. Uh, you know, everybody's been like dining, feasting on this interest rate thing, getting a cut in June or whatever, which we don't think is going to happen. But they're already discounting vol for the next, like, they're putting the summer in the summer, like, already. So I thought that was pretty, you know, I thought that was interesting, substantial, and we could see lower vol, basically, is the, the short answer. And this is how, how does VIX get lower? You know, when the major, when the major liquidity providers are long, like, you know, 50 million Vega, that's how it gets lower, 100 million Vega, whatever the number is now, because so many contracts trade, who knows? Um, and that's how that's how VIX prints a low uh, or a new low. So we haven't had the 11 handle, I don't think, since December. So I think at least for right now, OCPI, we, we could see something like that, but pretty low vol. Um, and I also believe some of the upside is kind of out of the market, maybe until NVIDIA prints their earnings on the 22nd. So kind of in like this funky little lull here for uh, for VIX. Could be wrong, but um, that's what I think the market is telling us today. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because I had a similar thought when I saw everyone just crushing all this vol. I was like, wow, they just waited for pretty much the, the first week of May. You know, I hate that cliche, but they're just going for it. They're selling everything. <laughs> oh, it's May already on the calendar. Calendar flip. Bam. Hit all the bits. That seems like what is happening out there because they have no reticence at all about selling any vol, uh, which is a long way around to saying, Mr. Uh, Rock Lops, those UVXY uh, June 20 puts that you mocked. I'll tell you what, I'll let them go to you for a buck right now. Nice guy that I am. I'll let you have a piece of that action <laughs> if you insist. Get it? I mean, it's like you you could almost I don't think it's outside of the theoretical decay line, but you know, there's there they are eight cent bid now. You can get out for eight cents. I'll be I'll be generous. I'll let you have them for a dollar. You know, I'll let you get in on the party. You know, why why <laughs> why trade that listed offer when you could trade the OTC quality value that I'm offering you here today, right. Liz? I, I guess things look differently if Vix prints eleven. Then you'll be <laughs> yes. then you'll be laughing all the way. To laughing the all the way to the proverbial bank. Let's go out now to the newly minted Dr. V stocks. I got to work that into the lexicon a little bit. A few more syllables, a little bit more work for the tongue. What do you think, listeners? You like that? But he is he is crunching the numbers out there on V stocks. We'll get to all that fun in a second. Keep your V stocks powder dry right now, Mr. Rose. What is catching your eye in the rest of the volatility space this week? As we were just saying, uh, they are definitely coming to do something in May. I won't say what it is because it's part of a cliche. Uh, oh, you, you, you mean they uh, buy away on VIX? Yes, that's exactly what the cliche is. Um, you know, it, it, I, I, I'm kind of shocked. I really, I, I'm just, it seems like good news, bad news, or any news all seems to be good news. We, we don't have, you know, major uh, numbers facing us right now because we've got, um, you know, we just got the employment number and the FOMC behind us last week. But... We've got PPI and CPI next week, and I, uh, I you know, maybe I'm just kind of hanging my hat on. I feel like I've been saying we got to get a second round of inflation. We got to get a second round of inflation. Uh, it does not appear that it is coming, uh, and Powell made it sound like they don't expect it either. 
Uh, and we all know that, that that those guys are complete geniuses and never make any mistakes. So, you know, we got Vix you know, with a freaking 12 handle, which just blows me away at this moment. It really does. The one thing that I do find kind of interesting is last week when we went out, uh, you know, just finished up the week, I think the, the curve was uh, somewhat flat. And and the futures have not gone down as much in line with the spot this week at all. So there is a little bit of bracing uh, with the May contract at a little over uh, a little under, sorry, a uh, dollar premium to the spot fix. You know, maybe that's a function of we do have a couple of numbers next week. Um, I don't know. Uh, that just that just might be you know a thought with respect to to the curve. Uh, and we continue to, uh, you know, June, July, August, we're still kind of uh, got a bit of a premium. So there's a bit of nervousness out there, but it's not nearly as much nervousness as we've had maybe the past two or three months. Um, you know, maybe it's sometimes the, the biggest uh, the biggest moves in VIX are a combination of surprise and, um, you know, volatility. And, and maybe we're setting up for. Uh, some sort of big surprise where you can actually benefit from it right now. Is there a big surprise in the offing listeners? Let's find out as we keep on rolling out there into the land of the volatility surface right now. And as you might guess, that's a whole term structure shifting down a wee bit. As we kicked off the show, the June future was down a little over a half a point, about six tenths of a point. And that front May future down nearly a full point, about 0.85 so coming in quite a bit. If we go all the way out, we're at about a 1370 when we kicked off the show in that May future. If you go all the way out to that October time frame everybody's looking at right now, we're at about an 1870 out there. So fully five points between May and October. I'll leave that up to you whether you think that's too steep, whether that's just right Goldilocks level of contango. One thing for sure, we don't have to have the backward debate this week. No backwardation out there in the VIX futures term structure. Mr. Thurston Howell III, sir, we'll start with you. What is what is catching your eye out there on the ball surface, if anything, this week? Um, it's starting to normalize a little, yeah. you know, because I I have like the the Andrew weird uh, VIX theoretical value. Um that I, I measure from basically zone one. So how much forward value is in the curve normally when the market is, you know, running the 12 handle or in zone one, you know, vol, vol expectations short term are very low, you know, and you get the kind of the big upward sloping curve, right? And we did like a regression and fit a line. And so I go, okay, so that's kind of what happens when things are normal. And then everything that's not normal is, you know, basically realize vol picks up. Uh, so I kind of go with, okay, when the market's not moving, what's the curve look like? And then when the market moves, who knows, right? You don't, like, who knows? Because you could be moving anywhere. So we are approaching for the first time probably since January, I'm going to say, the last time this actually starts to fit my ideal line, I believe. So you're getting um, like the spot vol lower and the volatility futures higher, got higher forward vols now and lower short-term vol. So, um, and that's that sets up for kind of the slow melt on the, on the um, like the vol products and things like that. Um, it's harder though, because, you know, from VIX here, like, you know, it ain't going to 10 tomorrow. So it can go to 15 tomorrow, but it ain't going to 10. So you have kind of that, you know, that vol curve, a steep vol curve lends itself to kind of a slower moving uh, downward VIX and like little tiny decay in the vol products. So, but you'll see like S VIX and stuff like that, you know, they're all they're all bumping up today a little bit and UVIX and VXX and all those are bumping down and it could be like that for a while. I mean, I don't know how long it's going to last, but at least for right now, it's the first time we've had a semi-normal looking contango curve in like six weeks, eight weeks, I'll say 12 weeks. It's been a while. Um, and usually that means, you know, the market's expecting less going forward, less movement. So 
That's that's what we got. I'm just reading. I'm just reading the tea leaves that are presented to me. Ah, the tea leaves, Mister Doctor V Stock, sir. What tea leaves are you reading this week? Uh, tea. I just you know paying attention to the curve, like like uh, Andrew just said, uh, but also that that really low. V, you know, I, VIX being down is one thing, but when VIX and V stocks are down together, like they are right now at such low levels. Uh, you know, often we'll see VIX reach a low level and it will attract some call buyers uh, just because of the nature of, of the mean reversion of VIX. And when it's at a pretty low level, uh, you got you might get a lot of bang for your buck if you get some sort of sell off in the equity market. Um, so I, I'm just surprised to see uh, V stocks as as low as it is right now when VIX has given you long opportunities. But, you know, VIX is back down. uh where it was uh, near the lows back in December. And I don't think, you know, I, I feel like we might be getting some, some tail risk exhaustion yet yeah, where, uh, you know, there, we, we've been buying protection, you buy protection, it, it expires with no value. Uh, you keep going that route and eventually you're like, why am I buying all this insurance? You know, heck, summertime's a really quiet time. Let's, uh, let, let's skip on the hedging right now. And, you know, that, that it, it just might be some hedging exhaustion out there among, um, you know, those players that, that are the, the, you know, the long volatility players in the vol space. Let's keep on rolling, listeners, into the land of VIX, because, again, Mr. Thurston Howell has to go put his, put his boat in the water. Well, let's go out there today. Is it a banger day on the VIX options front? The answer is, eh, kind of. 433, so it's respectable. All things considered, not lighting the world on fire, but not a buck fifty either. Uh, the ADV has dipped a little bit below nine hundred k, eight ninety eight right now. It's down six thousand on the week. In terms of top ten, what's going on out there in VIX land right now, listeners? Well, it cost you oh two hundred three thousand contracts to break into the top ten, and we are still nine to one calls over puts. I'll break all that fun down. We'll also get to the. Russell's weekly rundown in a second, but I know Mr. Howell has to go. He's already submitted his crystal ball pick, so I will I will reveal that at the end of the show. Keep you waiting a little bit, listeners. I unfortunately had to see it, so I won't let it color my prognostic because I never do. I oh, you know, I always fade uh, the rock lobster. But Mr. Rock Lobster, uh, before you have to shuffle off the volatility plane here, sir, anything catching your eye from an activity perspective in VIX options this week, including this very funky ratio looks like they sold calls and then they bought a put spread maybe and also sold like did a synthetic on monday all kinds of funk for about a couple hundred thousand contracts on monday and then anything catching your eye out there in uh, the rest of the vol etp universe sir um i i didn't see like a ton of volume there is some play like you know if you think VIX are, it's possible that's going down, you want to see some like downside put action. And I, in June, I mean, the busiest contract is the June 13 put. So um, at least go looking at, you know, 10 strikes up, 10 strikes down, um, which all of a sudden, you know, with VIX at 1274, the 13 put for 35 cents looks kind of appetizing. Um the problem is, is we have not been able to stay below 13 for any length of time in 2024. Um, so, you know, I would think we would see more like risk reversal action, stuff like that uh, down here. But um, I mean, besides that type of trade, I nothing really has caught my eye big this week. And I think mostly because VIX has not done very much. It's kind of just sort of slid down a little, um, which doesn't which does not bring the buying bros in, I should say. <laughs> the buying bros. <laughs> Sounds like, uh, you know, a speculating company. They come in, maybe they, they buy up those old storage units and see what they get, <laughs> you know, like on those hoarding shows or whatever. Oh, the buying bros are in town. What are they going to buy today? Maybe they're a real estate firm. We buy your, we buy your house with cash. <laughs> well, and nothing catching your eye in the ETPs this week, sir? You're not slinging any UVXY or your beloved VXX or... Or SVIX or anything? Um, I, I tried buying some SVIX calls uh, because, like, the 30-day erosion trade was setting up well. But I, put it this way. I bid in the, mid, in the middle, and I got laughed at for two straight days. So no one was in 
you know, with the vol this low, you pretty much have to take the offer if you want anything. So I'll just say that if you're trying to buy calls in the these the inverse vol products or buying, I didn't buy try to I didn't try to buy any puts this week, just the it calls in the inverse 30 days out. Uh, you were you were mocked and scorned for your bid point bid. Isn't that the best when you put an offer in on your trading platform and the laughter just comes reverberating back through your computer speakers or perhaps uh, your phone? <laughs> they just they just exactly. play a sound. Your, your your ten or twenty lot becomes two thousand all of a sudden. You're like, oh, I guess I guess this is really what they wanted to do. <laughs> just a cascade of laughter just pouring through your speakers, saying, "How dare you!" Who do you think you are out here moving our markets? Well, Mr. Mr. Thurston Howell III, you have to go move your boat, or excuse me, your yacht. Uh, so before you go, sir, what do you want people to know? And also, where should they go if they want more maybe uh, yacht advice and like what what lacquer goes well for shining the deck? You know, all that fun, fun stuff, all the boat stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 888 optionpitcom Yeah, if you want to trade, uh, trade Vol and SPX. Or SPY almost every day. So come on in and check it out and see how you can use these vault products and the indexes. There you go. There you go. Check him out at optionpit.com and indeed his newest URL, yachtfun.com. He's got a fun little captain's hat on the cover of the homepage. It's good stuff. Check it out, listeners, over there. And you'll get his vol prognostication in a little bit. But now it is time for us to sink our teeth into all this paper here on the VIX front. And like I said, not, a, not the most banger of days, but we'll get to all that fun in a second. Let's look at the top 10 size positions. Then we'll get to what everybody here is really waiting for. A little bit of Russell's weekly rundown action. But before we get there, number 10 listeners, our first and only put in the top 10 this week can be found right at the beginning at number 10, 203,000 of the May 15 puts. And the rest all calls all the time. So if you're here for a bit of a VIX put palooza, I dare I say, it, go elsewhere. <laughs> But uh, number nine, 212,000 of the June 20s out there. Dare I say it, the very reasonable June 20s. Number eight, 219,000 of the May 16. So even more reasonable. Interesting. A lot of reasonable paper to kick off the week this week. Number seven, 220 of the May 47. Oh, here we go. Right back at it. May 47 halves. That's what we know and love. Number six, 228,000 of the AUG 47 halves. And I know they're not buying the 47 halves as part of those ratios and they're short them. I get it. It's just a, on its surface, ridiculous strike. <laughs> Number five, 232,000 of the May 25s. Feel free, all you funds are trading. Come at me. Go ahead. We'll have a, a fun debate on the show about why that's a ridiculous strike. <laughs> number five, 232,000 of the May 25s. Number four, 251,000 of the June 35s. Number three, 264,000 of the May 35s. So June not doing it for you. A little closer to the fire in May. May 35s, are we going to get there? Clock's ticking on those bad boys. Uh, number two, 271,000 of the May 20s. And number one, yet again, 324,000 of the May 18s, looking ever more optimistic now. 18s didn't seem like that outlandish not too long ago. Now 18 seems like a lot of heavy lifting has to be done in the vol space to make those relevant again before expiration. But you know what's always relevant? We're always here for it. It's a little bit of Russell's Weekly Rundown. Now, Russell's Weekly Rundown. Russell's Weekly Rundown. All right. The theme's so nice, we have to play it twice. Mr. Rhodes, sir, I hear you have an extra special 27-minute Russell's Weekly Rundown for us, have it? No, it's a, and actually, it's, it's a, it, was a, uh, it was the quietest week for weeklies that I've seen in some time. And that, that may just be going along with what, we, you know, what, what, what we've just been talking about, you know? If you're using weeklies, you're typically targeting, uh, you know, some sort of economic number. If you're using the, you know, if you're using the weeklies that expire this coming Wednesday, I believe PPI comes out the day before, uh, and then CPI comes out the next day. So, so you know, generally, I, I can pinpoint some of the, you know, what they're doing date-wise on these things. Uh, not really, it, not, not just not a lot of interesting stuff here. But um, we're going to coin a new term. You, you love it when I come on and try to Ooh, coin. I like terms. new terms. I'm kind of bummed that Andrew's not going to be here for it because <laughs> I love his one laugh laugh at the things that I come up with. 
So on Monday, 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 uh, with VIX up at uh, the nosebleed 1363, uh, we had a seller of 4,000 of the May 15th, 17 calls for 22 cents. Uh, I don't know if that's worth 22 cents, but, you know, I've also keep waiting for the end of the world and that doesn't come either. Uh, then on Tuesday, uh, we had a buyer, and I, I do like this trade, and, and we've seen last week when I did this, we saw a lot of interest for calls uh, that expired on the last Wednesday of this month, or May 29th. Uh, we got a buyer of 4,000 of the VIX May 29th, 17 calls for 55 cents. Uh, they did that yet on Tuesday, sorry, when VIX was at 1331. Now, I'm going to go through three trades that are all a funny size and all appear to be similar, and they were done over the course of a couple of days, and they're a triple stupid. You ready? And it's a triple turnaround stupid, Ooh. And, and you'll know why in a minute. Uh, so on Thursday with VIX at 1289, they bought the VIX May 15th 14 calls for 58 cents. And then on Thursday, I believe a little bit a little earlier in the day, actually, with VIX at 1310, they bought the VIX May 15th, 14 and a half calls for 31 cents. And then this morning, with VIX again back down at 1289, uh, they bought 180 of the VIX May 15th, 15 calls for 25 cents. They bought 180 of the 14 calls, 180 of the 14 and a half calls, and 180 of the 15 calls. So this is a VIX turnaround stupid because we they expect everybody to do a 180 <laughs> they thought they would slip under the radar only doing their 180 lots no one would notice them it's not a 5,000 loss not a 10,000 loss not what normally gets on our radar but no you have been uncovered by the sleuth that is dr vix triple stupid now it's not quite the stupid because it wasn't all done at the outset right so i kind of call these when they're kind of legging into a more of an inertial stupid. But in this case, it's inertial going the other way. It kept going against them. <laughs> they kept buying farther out of the money yeah. strikes. So that's that's a little bit of a head scratcher. Usually you do it this way. Maybe you buy, what was it, the first strike? The 14, you said, or 14 halves? And then uh, you... Uh, they did the 14. I think they actually did the 14 halves before the 14s. I'm going to check That's time That's just quick. bonkers to me then. So yeah, yeah usually uh, you buy the lower strike. It moves your way. And maybe you want to buy a little more, but this, it's already moved your way. So you kind of buy some more at the money which whatever is the higher strike i could see doing it that way it's really the only use case i have for a stupid but doing it this way all sorts of backwards <laughs> yeah they actually they did do the 14 and a half before the 14s i just did them in the order of the strikes just <laughs> maybe just because i because you know what it's my segment and i do whatever the hell i want maybe it's a capitulation stupid because they bought the 14 and a half so fell out of bed like okay i guess we got by the fourth i don't know what they're doing with the 15s and that's just uh that's a head scratcher to me as well. Like that's that's completely backwards what they're doing. I, I think they're just mad. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show them. The, uh, I, and, and I I worked at a uh, I, I worked at a prop trading place like 25 years ago, and we had this one person that would always try to put on a revenge trade. Market's wrong. I'm doubling down right now. And and uh, the head guy would always go, Ah, the revenge trade. I'm guessing oh, that guy had a long and successful trading career. Yeah. So, no, I don't know where they are now. <laughs> I don't know. This <laughs> triple stupid, this triple stupid trader, I'm thinking he won't have a long, especially the way he did it. I mean, what are you doing? I, I could see starting with the 15s and, oh, it's going against me. Okay, now I'm doing 14 halves. Oh, still going against me. Now I, I leverage down to the, I could maybe see an argument for that. I still don't love it. But the other way, that makes zero sense. So, yeah, it's not, not a whole lot of logic. And, um, but we'll see. You know, you and I are sitting here talking and, uh, you know, we, we do have, we are getting pelted by a geomagnetic magnetic storm right now. <laughs> oh, so we could go off the air at any moment. No, they, they, they've actually had some, some problems with radios and stuff, uh, over in Europe when they were facing the sun and now it's supposed to be hitting us. Um, you know, that I, I personally think that's, I think Andrew was out there. He's actually a, a, a spy master and he's got to make sure that all of his equipment's going to survive the solar storm. <laughs> we are the old options insider radio network, so they could come for us next, sir. You never know. Anything else catching your eye on the weekly front, sir? No, it really. I mean, that the trade that I just told you was the only weekly trade today. Yeah, that was a uh, that was an interesting. It really one, was not the the best. The last couple of weeks, and because I, I hadn't been on in a while, 
uh, the last couple of weeks, I was like, man, people are really, you know, starting to use weeklies an awful lot. They're making it easy on me. And you, you, when you started off, uh, you used to start off saying, uh, now you've got 23 minutes to do this. And in, I think the inside joke there was always, um, yeah, you got 23 minutes to do this. You probably could talk about every single week, weekly trade in 23 minutes <laughs> in the past couple of weeks. I couldn't have, but this week it, it just, uh, it, it wasn't, uh, as active, uh, with the weeklies. You know what? We're spooking them. They know you're going to sniff them out now, even their 180 lots. So they're a little bit more reticent to pull the trigger because they know you're going to make fun of them here on the show <laughs> when they're legging into their triple stupids. <laughs> Triple stupid. <laughs> the okay. dreaded, the dreaded triple stupid. All right, let's keep rolling out here, see what else is lighting it up this week in a kind of light week. Like we said, today, 428,000 contracts on the tape for VIX. The big dog, 33,000 of the May 17s. You like those listeners? 17 strike. Now, number two, 21,000 of the May 18s. Number three, 21,000 as well, the May 16s. So maybe a little bit of vertical action there. Number four, about 20,000 of the June 13 puts. Rock Lobster just talking about those, saying those are kind of uh, the trade du jour he's been noticing out there in VIX for a while. Let's look really quickly and see what those bad boys are going up for today. Uh, prices around 30 cents, listeners, 29 to 31 cents. So you like those June 13 puts for 30 cents? Is that a good do, do you think? And then about 20,000 as well of the May 20 calls rounding out a kind of light day. Yesterday, also fairly light, 543 on the tape. The big dog, 36,500 of the June 26s. Weird size, weird strike, all kinds of weird. Number two, also 36,000 of the June 30. So maybe some funky vertical action there. Number three, 30,000 of the May 18s. Number four, 29,000 and change of the June 20s. And rounding out the top five yesterday, 22,000 of the May 13 half puts. A Wednesday, also fairly light, 640 on the tape. The big dog, 46,004. Of the May 16 calls, followed by 35,000 on the May 15 halves, 35,000 as well of the May 14 calls, number four, 32,000 of the May 14 puts, and rounding out the top five on a fairly light Wednesday, 31,000 of the May 18 calls. Tuesday was the banger day, 1.2 million. That's the first M handle we've seen in VIX in a little while. Even Fed Week didn't really gin up the volume like we'd expect. 106,000 was your big print on Tuesday. That was the June 14 puts, followed by 83,000 for number two of the June 20s, 65,000 for number three of the June 30s, number four, 64,000 of the June 15 puts, and rounding out the top five on an active Tuesday, 63,000 of the May 13 half puts. Scrolling back to Monday, a decently active day as well. Not quite a million, but close. 876 on the tape. The big dog, this is a weird one, Mr. Rose. I'm not sure if you saw this one. The big dog, 76,000 of the AUG 25 calls and 76,000 of the AUG 15 puts for two. Number three, 46,000 of the AUG 16 calls. Number four, 46,000 of the AUG 16 puts. And rounding out the top five, 29,000 of the July 14 puts. We did notice this during the option block on Monday. I said we might come back to it on Bob Views. A print that went up on Monday, all kinds of funky, and all went up late too. So take some of these executions with a bit of a grain of salt. Looks like paper sold 75,000 of the AUG 25 calls for 86 cents, then bought maybe the 62,500 of the 15 puts, also in August, for a buck 27. So first blush, like, oh, they're doing. Maybe a collar on VIX. You don't see it too often, but a collar paid 41 cents for it. But then you notice they snuck in there at the same time. Uh, looks like they sold the 36,250 of the AUG 16 calls for 206 and bought 43,500 of the AUG 16 puts. So doing a synthetic short on that strike as well for a buck 91. So doing that whole thing for looks like 15 cents there. So yeah, just all sorts of weirdness ratios. Looks like they ended up net doing 76,000 as well of the 15 puts. And then, for, yeah, the, the ratios were all sorts of funky. It looks like on the surface, Mr. Rhodes, they were doing a ratio synthetic short on the 16 strike in August. And then against it, potentially buying 62,000. And actually, I guess they bumped it up to 76,000 total eventually of the that would at least line up volume wise of the AUG 15 puts and also selling about 76,000 of the AUG 25 calls. So all sorts of funk in this one. Did you notice this crazy print going up on Monday, sir? I didn't. Um, I, had a, I, I wrote one up last weekend that that was similar where there was a, 
a synthetic long that was put on and then um, not as many calls sold against that synthetic long. I, I'm looking at the quotes when they put on the synthetic leg of this because it would make a heck of a lot more sense to me if they were synthetically long. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. They sold the call and bought the plane. Yes, exactly. Uh, the <laughs> only other thing that I can think of is and and how many did they do of the uh, how how big was the collar? Oh, uh, seventy six thousand of the outside legs. And what was the? Because I I mean this is done in so many legs and I'm looking at it right now. It, it's easier for me to ask you the numbers. And then uh, what's the size of the synthetic? Uh, it's forty three thousand five hundred of the puts for a buck ninety one and thirty six thousand two hundred and fifty uh. of the calls for two oh six. So they could have tried to do that for kind of you know a neutral level as well. But yeah, it's it's all sorts of. Funkalicious funk, as we like to say out there in the vol space, sir. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the tape uh, when I have a chance. Yeah, you know it went up late too. So usually, that's usually it's easier for me to to do a little quantitative work while you chat with the other guests, but there is no other. <laughs> there is another guest. So and we have to get to the uh, V stocks in a little bit too. But what I'm what I'm actually thinking here is I, what I want to do is I want to go look and see if there's any. Uh, large volume in the August futures around the same time. Yeah, as a, it has to be a futures you leg that we're missing. I, I just that that's really what I want to what I want to try to do. But again, typing and talking ain't my strength yeah. anymore. Long futures, short the synthetic against it, and then this funky collar around it. It'd be a weird one, but uh, we have seen weird things uh, in the past in VIX land. You're right. I like it a lot better the other way if they're buying the synthetic. And again, take some of these executions with a grain of salt because it all went up late, listeners. So. We have to kind of dig in a little bit more, they, but they nego which means they negotiated it out. Yes, of the pit, yes. And then they put it on the tape. They they figured out who was going to get a piece yep. and and all of that kind of stuff. For those of you that haven't seen what's going on on the floor, I loved when things like that would go on back when I was at SIBO because um, they would, uh, yeah, I, it, it would give me an opportunity to kind of explain what kind of trades were being negotiated out when they did things. That's fun. Like that. well, meanwhile, when you're on the floor, you. You hate this stuff because you, you don't see any of it until it's printed in your face. But that's a conversation now, for another there, there's day. There's a, a time period around when the when this hit the tape uh, where you've got some decent August volume. So I might uh, might be onto something here. I'm oh. just looking at an uh, intraday chart. We might have a future uh, Substack entry for the once and future and now present Dr. V-Stock. Speaking of his newly minted doctorate, let's get right now to a little bit of the International Volatility Review. It's time to explore what's happening in the volatility market beyond our shores. It's time for the International Volatility Review. The International Volatility Segment is brought to you by Eurex, home of Euro stocks, V stocks, DAX, and the German government bond based Eurobund, Eurobobble, Euroshots Derivatives. Eurex is the leading European derivatives exchange. Learn more about trading V-Stocks futures and options, the European volatility benchmark at www.eurex.com slash V-Stocks. All right, everybody, welcome to the International Vol Review. And if you want even more International Vol goodness, stay tuned to the end of the show, right after the end of the show, because we'll have a bonus International Vol segment holding down the Eurex hot seat this week. We'll have Gary Norton, uh, the hedge fund manager over there at NN Squared Cap. You may have also seen him on YouTube doing a lot of uh, futures and options educating over there. So fascinating stuff looking at the international vol perspective. And speaking of the international vol perspective, as you might imagine, V stocks moving in the same direction as VIX. VIX was down a full point this week. V stocks was down almost a full point, about eight tenths of a point. So are they moving back one to one again? Well, I guess we'll have to find out. V stocks when we kicked off the show was at a 1360. Again, that 52 week range on V stocks, the high 23 and a third back in October of last year. The low came 12 12 in December of last year. We did threaten it again earlier this year in March, and looks like we're going to start maybe this continues threatening it again of this whole. Dare I say it, sell in May and fill in the rest continues on the vol side. Uh, we might be threading that again out there. But Mr. Rhodes, oh, excuse me, the newly minted once in future Dr. V stocks. You've been crunching a lot of the numbers out here. Uh, v stocks coming into the show, 1360. What's been catching your eye out there this week? 
Um, well, I, I, we, we talked a bit about the, the approach that I take, and I, I do trade V-stocks and VIX against each other. Uh, I got a pretty simple uh, process to go about doing that. Uh, if I could, you know, get everybody to leave me alone and, and seal myself in a basement for about 12 hours, I could finally write the freaking thing up. Um, but I'm, I'm still short, uh, still short V stocks and still, and, and I'm, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I'm still long VIX and short V stocks. Uh, it's been, a, it's been almost exactly a month. It was, uh, five Fridays ago, I believe where I, sw where I flipped over, uh, down 260 on my long VIX, but up four points on my short V stocks. Uh, typically the, the average front month future spread over, uh, for V stocks versus VIX is V stocks at a buck 60 premium to, uh, VIX. And, um, you know, it, 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 I take a look at those spreads. I, I take a look at, uh, the relationship over the last uh, 10 days or so. And, and when we get to an extreme in one direction or another, I flip from being long one and short the other. So I'm always in the market. I'm always either long V stocks and short VIX or long VIX and short V stocks. And I continue to be, uh, um, short, uh, short the V stocks and long VIX. Um, it, you know, V stocks, it, it does hold up a bit more than, than VIX historically. Uh, it's doing it right now, continues to do that. Uh, you've got to assume that there's more risk on the doorstep of the companies that comprise the Euro stocks 50 than the S&P 500 right now. Uh, there's still some, uh, you know, there, there's still some residual stuff going on that goes all the way back to Brexit that's impacting business over in Europe. Uh, it takes forever to work some of these things out. So, uh, you know, you would expect uh, the uh, to be stocks to be at a premium right now. Uh, it's actually at a 30 or when I priced it out, which is at a 11 a.m. Eastern every day, uh, the B stocks was actually at a 35 cent discount to um, at a 35 cent discount to spot VIX. And you know what? That's a signal to flip my position. Uh -oh. I, uh oh, I just I totally missed the little signal there. So uh, it's time for me to go buy at when we're done and nobody front run me when we're done in 11 minutes. I've got to go uh, cover my short B stocks and uh, sell my VIX and flip to being short VIX and long V stocks. So uh, the signal did flip. Uh, just before mid morning this morning, I was just uh, had my head looking for all those weekly trades. Uh, so <laughs> welcome to my uh, world. You miss that, trades because you're right now too busy I, doing I, shows that you miss all the trades. Welcome to my world, sir. <laughs> yeah, so, I I miss an awful lot these days. So you're flipping uh, you're flipping your spread just to be clear here for our listeners. Yeah, you are I'm not flipping my spread. I was I was looking and then I just I, I kind of I, I I have a, a spreadsheet that just pulls the numbers in at, at, again at eleven Eastern each day. And I just had, I, there's one little cell that tells me when the signal changes. And I just looked at the cell and I'm like, oh my goodness, the signal changed. Um, so I got to go do some trading. That you do, sir. And, you know, interesting, I was chatting with our guest at the end of the show, which you'll hear in a few minutes, listeners, about VIX versus V-Stock, some of the things you were just laying down. And he was making an interesting point, one I believe you've made in the past as well, that he is kind of a little more intrigued looking forward for maybe more potential upside in V stocks versus VIX. And not just for the election premium, everything's got election premium baked into it, but also obviously with V stocks, there's a little bit extra added in there because of all the tensions with Ukraine. We have seen in the past that when things do flare up in that side of the world, V stocks, as you probably would expect, does tend to outperform. Last time it was somewhere around 10 points in the V stocks versus the VIX cash. So you can maybe look for something in that range potentially, maybe more if, if things are extremely dramatic out there. So does that potential maybe for a little bit more outperformance for the upside in the near term in V stocks? You think that's on the table, sir? Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and anytime that we get a, a, what we refer to as a volatility event, and it's interesting that, that it was mentioned, uh, you know, on the recording or, you know, on the pre-recorded comments that you're going to share in a sec. Uh, but typically when we do get a volatility event and it, uh, has some sort of impact on Europe, uh, you do get more bang for your buck out of V stocks than, than, um, you do from fix. So, yeah, I, when, when he says there's some potential more, 
potentially more upside out of V-Stocks than VIX these days. Uh, it's very, very difficult to disagree with that one. Yeah, intriguing stuff. It's always fun to hear, you know, it's called the International Vol Review, after all. It's always fun to hear the international perspective on even domestic things, like how the term structure is looking, how much juice they're pricing in for the U.S. election overseas, how potentially also the fact that because Ukraine is a part of this election domestically here as well, how there's an, maybe an extra potential for a little bit more upside, depending on the outcome of the U.S. election in V stocks as well. So it's kind of an intriguing perspective. Again, the international view on how Vol is looking. So stay tuned for that out there in a little bit. Listeners, as we keep on rolling, we got to get to the crystal ball. Before we get there, we have to hit on Mr. Rhodes' uh, favorite product because it did hit a new 52-week high, as we were talking today, of 43.82. That's about a 43.70 right now. What am I talking about? I'm talking about his beloved SVIX. Up, it was up 220 when we kicked off the show. Got a little higher, up about 232 to get that all-time high out there. So Mr. Rhodes famously said he, was over, he wasn't fully out. Maybe that has changed now. Maybe he has... At this new all-time high, maybe he's getting the heck out of Dodge. Uh, volume today was looking surprisingly robust, so the addition of those weeklies does seem to have helped things out. Also, probably a new all-time high. Not hurting things either out there. 7,000 contracts on the tape right now. That's not quite 2x. We're pretty close to it of the ADV, which is about 4,400 or so out there. So looking a little bit more robust. The size position out there right now is 2,600 of the June 45s. And if you're wondering, what are folks slinging out there today? Almost a 1,000 of the June 42 puts. That's interesting. June 42 puts. Let's see. What are those bad boys going up for? They're going up for $2.30. Like paper might have been selling those. Ooh, that's... That's aggressive, selling the June 42 puts. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I like that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love no, uh, it, 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 we don't like them and, and, until they worked out quite well, you know, <laughs> so, uh, you know, maybe they're seeing something that we don't necessarily see. Uh, I, um, I, I, I have a whopping 100 SVIX right now. So you're out of everything but the hundred lot. All the rest of it has been called away. Oh, uh, I, I, I've been flip flopping. Do I sell, you know, do I sell the 44 call that expires in a week? Uh, and, you know, and then, cause I do plan on adding to it, but that those are 40 cents by 90 cents right now. I just don't, I don't feel like that's worth it. So I'm, I'm hanging on to my, uh, my soul 100 SVIX for the moment. Uh, probably add, I'll probably start selling puts, uh, if it gets closer to 40 with the antenna picking some up. Yeah, obviously we joke about the 42 puts. I don't think either of those like those, but what is a strike? What is a level you would think about nibbling at here? Oh, definitely 40. It, it's just kind of a, a, a psychological number as oh. well. But, um, you know, a 10%, a 10 percent retracement, that's really where I'm coming up with that number. It's not just because it's a um, round number, but a 10% retracement is where I get interested in trying to get longer. You're not afraid of the uh, Middle East vol explosion coming in and just wiping SVIX down to a yeah. nine? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, just on this topic real quick uh, and it, last night was my la was the final evening that I was teaching um, uh, Kelly direct uh, um, um, uh, it, fi it, finance class and the last session is about options and stuff and uh, you know I, I got the question why doesn't everybody just buy SVix and go away and I pulled up some old charts to show why you don't do that including Volmageddon. <laughs> well, they were probably like 12 years old in February of 2018. So I guess it makes some sense. They wouldn't know that. But uh, <laughs> you don't have to dial the way back machine that far to see <laughs> the last time. Yeah. Well, I mean, they say it's 2018. And we haven't gone and looked. I haven't gone and checked in a while. The, the call holdings on SVIX. Obviously, they have that as a as a protection for that rainy day. So you would expect it not to go the way of the dodo the way uh, XIV did, but still an intriguing scenario. How low can they go in, in SVIX is a good maybe theoretical question. Maybe we'll debate that on a future show, Mr. Once and Future Dr. Vix. As we keep on rolling out to the sibling product, UVIX, that one can get lower. 720 right now, down almost three quarters of a point on the week. Putting up 34,000 contracts today. The ADV is only 32,000, so that one's looking pretty active out there today. 
And if you're wondering what the size position is out there in UVix, it's 7,828 of the May 11 halves that expire next week. So 11 half calls. Hopefully they overwrote those a long time ago. <laughs> They're looking, looking pretty good right now. UVXY continues to erode as well at 28 when we kicked off the show down two points. So take that, Mr. Rock Lobster, mocking my far out of the money UVXY puts. <laughs> Uh, 38,000 contracts on the tape today. Uh, the ADB 49,000 continuing to move in the wrong direction, down another 21,000. So clearly this reverse split jazz ain't doing it for him on a volume perspective. Uh, they kind of have uh, have kiboshed their product a little bit out here. In terms of uh, big positions, we got about 15,000 of the June 8 calls, 8 O's. So these are obviously must be pre-split adjusted eight calls <laughs> uh, intriguing is that's also obviously gumming up the works we have these vestigial options positions out there now as a result of the split listeners which makes things a little bit more complicated for folks uh, vxx coming in to start of the show and as of right now still at about a 12 20 down about half a point putting up sixty one thousand contracts today the adv is eighty five thousand. that's down about three thousand on the week and the big boy position out there 17 almost eighteen thousand of the june 13 puts, which are looking pretty good right now. Mr. Rose, anything catching your eye in the rest of the Vol ETPs out there this week, sir? Uh, no, not really. I uh, I did a little digging while you while we were talking and uh, while you were talking and our friends over at SVIX, uh, they did something that I, I, I haven't seen them do before, but I haven't paid that much attention. Uh, they did own the June 20, uh, the June uh, 30 calls. And they sold them yesterday and rolled down to now owning the June 26 calls. So I, 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 I've seen them roll out before. And, I, and like I said, I haven't paid that much. You know, I haven't focused that much. But, um, you know, that, that, they, they did do that since you brought up their holding. And it does make me a lot more comfortable to hold that one if we do get the volatility event. Uh, when my students were asking me about SVX, I just didn't even want to dive down into they also own some calls to hit, to hedge themselves uh, just because that would have opened a whole nother can of worms and another hour long discussion to to try to clarify it all. June 24 is going to give you a heck of a lot more bang for your buck, obviously, than the June 30. By the way, it was the 26. I might have misspoke. Oh, 26 is still better than the 30s. And by the way, listeners, of course, we're talking about the VIX calls that the SVIX folks hold against their SVIX position in case the, the worst does come to pass. So intriguing stuff out there. We've debated in the past. What does this really mean for SVIX? Is it going to gum up the works? Doesn't seem like it is right now with hitting yet another new all time high, but now it's time to put all that aside. Listeners, it's time to get dangerous. It is time for the crystal ball. It's time to peer into the future and reveal what the volatility gods hold in store. It's time to look into the crystal ball. All right, listeners, let's get to it. Let's get dangerous. As the old dark wing duck used to say last week on the show, it was myself. I was at a 13 double in VIX and a 1385 in V stocks. And we should say probably where VIX is at the end of the show here, listeners. That would probably help. And we're still pretty close to that 1275 level we were at the start of the show out there, about a 1270. So no joy for me. Meatball, 1551 in VIX, 1661 in V stocks. No joy for him. Uh, Russell, 1331 in VIX and a 1441. He's also going the, the palindromic route. <laughs> no joy for him either, listeners. And then, of course, we had Sophie from the Urex team last week, and she went 13 half on V stocks. So no joy for any of us. None of us within the tenth of a point. Actually, I take it back. She was picking V stocks, and V stocks actually came out at a uh, at a 1360. So here I am, coming into the start of the show at least at a 1360. So here I am, poo pooing everyone, and yet let me get the exact print. Yeah, it was 1360. So. I should actually tip my cap to Sophie because she is a, a winner, winner, chicken dinner. This shows listeners. I still have to dial in my V stock. So she gets a bullseye for the week. And then I was actually closer than I gave myself credit. I was at a 1385. So 1360 for V stocks, a quarter of a point off, given the fact that I'm still dialing in my, my models here. Not exactly the worst prognostication. 
I already have Andrews here. I'll read it out last so it doesn't color us. Mr. Rhodes, you want to go first or you want to go last for picking this week? Um, I'll... I'll go for, yeah, well, I'm just trying to figure out how should we do this because you know his guesses. Yeah, I I'd go last. You want to go last? Okay, I'll go first. Yeah, I should go last. I should go last. Just, you know, for fairness sake, you know, playground <laughs> bratty me would have gone, that's not fair. You know his numbers. Andrew's a coward, so he only went for Vix. He's not courageous enough to do both Vista. I shall, of course, do both. We had about a 1275 with 1360 coming into the show and Vstocks listeners. I would love to say I see more of upside in Vol on the horizon, but, you know, their lack of reticence in crushing the Vol out there, I don't know if that's going to change anytime soon. I'm going to say a little bit lower for myself. I'm going to say about a 12... Uh, I'm going to say about a 1225 in... Vix and now again where the V stocks falls in relation. I think I might that might maybe narrow a little bit as well. So I'm gonna say 1275 for V stocks. And I will I will give you Andrews as well, Mr. Rose, because I'm nice. He went sub 12 handle. He went eleven ninety-seven in VIX. So there you go. That's your mark of this week, Mr. Rose. What you got? What it, what was his what was his VIX? Sorry. Eleven ninety-seven. Oh wow. Yeah, I was good. I was actually going to go. Oh, I'm not going to do that now. Um, I'm going to go. I'm going 1226. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you probably would 12, do that. I'm sir. going. I'm going. I'm going to go 1289. Oh, a little extra juice. I was, I was actually thinking closer to 13 before you told everybody else's. And um, I'll do 1350 on V stocks. Interesting. Interesting. I wouldn't be upset to seeing that come to pass. I wouldn't accept to see more. But uh, yeah, I just, it seems like they're not reticent to hit the bid out there right now, listeners. All right. That music means we have come to the end of this week's Volatility Sojourn. But you know what? If you're listening on the on demand side, your saga is not done. No, you get a bonus, listeners, because we like you. And bonus international volatility review coming up immediately after this so you can hear what the uh, international perspective is on all things domestic and international vol stay tuned for that it's a very uh, intriguing conversation uh, we like getting folks on from across the pond even if sometimes we have to do it at different times <laughs> because otherwise it's the middle of the morning and they would be asleep during our time with the show but you know we like to bring on multiple perspectives so stay tuned for that after the show, listeners, of course, you know where to go to check out Andrew's yachting tips. It's uh, yachtingisgreat.com as well as optionpit.com, the place to go to learn more. Mr. Rhodes, where should folks go if they want to follow your sub stack or perhaps the latest V Stocks research you have coming out? Well, um, follow me on Twitter, and, and anything I put out, I automatically put out there on Twitter. Um, it's my full name, two L's. Two S's, two L's, Russell, R-H-O-A-D-S. Uh, my Substack is that full name, slash Substack. And those are probably the two best places to find everything I'm doing. Uh, if you just happen to be at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway come Tuesday next week, uh, search me out at the uh, at the Kelly School of Business table for the uh, big Indianapolis. Yeah, it, it, everybody kind of poo-poos the non-money center places. But the CFA, CFA Society of Indianapolis does a freaking awesome conference in the infield on the first day of practice every year, every year at the 500. Really? So, oh, yeah. Can you, can you even hear? <laughs> can you even hear the... Somebody's listening, come find me. Can you even hear the instruction with the cars racing around you? <laughs> it, we're, in the, we're in the infield inside. But oh, inside, okay. You do okay. get to walk around the garages and everything. It really is a cool event. I'll that, take you next year. There are definitely worse venues than that. I've actually never been to the Indy. All my years in Chicago, I've never been down to the old Brickyard, is what they call it, right? So uh, intriguing stuff out there. Check them out over there at Russell Rhodes, two L's, R-H-O-A-D-S on the old Twitters. And if you want to check out his vol research, urex.com, E-U-R-E-X is the place to go. Or if you want to go dive straight into V-Stocks, just go to stocks, S-T-O-X-X dot com. That'll get you straight to all the latest data, you know, open, close, historical data, volume, all the stuff you might want to know if you want to dip your toes into a little bit of V-Stocks trading. That's going to do it for us on the show this week. Again, stay tuned for the bonus international ball review segment. And then if you're listening live, I'll be back in a little bit with 
Options Oddities. If you want to check that out, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go to get that info. And we're back again next week, another episode of Volatility Views. Stay safe out there, everybody. All right, everybody, welcome to this bonus edition of the International Volatility Review, recording it outside of our usual showtime there on Fridays, because we have a guest who's beaming in from outside of, let's say, our time zone, (laughs) moving a few away, all the way over to Perth, Western Australia, where we are joined for the first time by Gary Norden, a hedge fund manager over there at NN Squared Capital, also a bit of a vol YouTuber. <laughs> Gary, welcome to the Volatility Views program. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. And, and Gary, as we are wont to do with all of our first timers here on the network, why don't you go ahead and give our audience a bit of an overview of your background in the world of derivatives, as well as what it is you do over there at NN Squared Capital. Sure. Um, so my derivatives background is over 30 years. I be started as a derivatives trader when I was 19 uh, for a Japanese investment bank trading Japanese warrants during the crash of the Nikkei. I moved down to in the early 90s to the life floor as an options market maker. Um, I also became head of options for NatWest, one of the, the largest banks, well, the largest bank at the time in the UK. Um, I've traded futures options, convertible bonds for investment banks. Um, so I've been around various different derivatives for over 30 years. Um, and in Squared is a startup uh, hedge fund. Uh, we have a kind of niche. Uh, we use derivatives to create uh, strategies with roughly zero correlation to uh, equity markets. Um, and I also have some training programs I, I run to train traders in, in derivative trading. Interesting. We obviously have a lot of guests on the network with, you know, backgrounds on the CBO like myself or CME or even NYSE or Amex on the derivative side. Don't get a lot from uh, the Asian or indeed the life perspective. Is that where the the colors, the yellow, the red and the blue, is that all come from the life trading floor? Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Yeah. There are no red jackets uh, on the CMEs. I was I was very curious about that. That's the apex course, I guess. That was the trading jacket on life. Yeah, the, the red jackets were what the locals wore. So obviously the banks were wearing their own colors and brokers were wearing their, you know, the colors of the brokerage houses they had, but only those that traded with their own money uh, wore red jackets. So, uh, you know, if you had a red jacket, you were trading with your own money. You're a real trader. Let's get into some uh, real trading talk right now, shall we? Of course, you're joining us on the International Volatility Review segment where we look a little bit farther afield, most of the show obviously based around a domestic vol, VIX, and all the ETPs that trade around it. But we like to look farther afield every now and then, look at things like V-stocks and also how international vol traders view even domestic volatility. So let's start there. It's obviously been an interesting couple of weeks on the volatility front, both internationally and domestically. We obviously have turmoil in the Middle East. We still have ongoing tension to put it mildly over there in Europe. So that's driving a lot of interest in the international vol front. Domestically, we have the Fed continuing to punt the ball. We, of course, have a a looming election down the road, which is causing an interesting little blip in the term structure for VIX futures. So a lot to unpack. What is lighting up your tape these days on the volatility front, Gary? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is what's creating so many uh, interesting potential opportunities out there. Uh, and, and let's throw in as well the Bank of Japan, right, that, that caused uh, a massive move uh, last Monday in, in the in the yen and probably are not finished on that front either. Uh, I think everybody should be watching that as well. What will they do uh, in terms of a more um, a more robust sort of method. Intervention is only obviously like a band-aid. So at some point, they're going to come in with something a bit more. And I think that's something that all traders should be watching for in the next three to four months. But um, yeah, given all this stuff, and we're just coming through earnings season as well, and not just in the US, but in overseas as well, um, we've got kind of interesting, you mentioned the term structure, and I think that's where the opportunities lie. We're heading into, into summer now. And Traditionally, it's a time I think that people will be looking to, you know, to, to perhaps sell vol uh, across the world. You know, we've come through this sort of uh, earning season okay. Um, but like you say, you've got these 
uh, geopolitical events still going on in, in, in the Middle East and Ukraine and uh, say the possibly the Bank of Japan. But what the term structure is allowing you is it's allowing you some trades that probably you wouldn't normally have or some opportunities. Um, so, for example, if, if people were looking at, let's say, V stocks uh, and, and futures in, in the front months, they're trading at, you know, 14 handles. Um, they still have potential scope to go lower if if vol you know continues to go lower in over the summer months if that's what people think. But often traders will think about well you know I don't really want to short something there. How much? What happens if any of these macro plays um, play up uh, and and it goes up? But the, the thing at the moment is with the term structure because of the election that election in the U.S. which you know will have a global effect depending on how it goes. Is obviously causing in October, November, uh, December futures uh, across both fee stocks and VIX to be a lot higher. And the reality is, it doesn't matter what happens in the short term to volatility; they are going to remain high. You know, people are going to want to hedge themselves, protect themselves going in. It's a potential vol event, uh, and we know the date of that vol event as well. So, you know, we should expect that those months are going to be are going to hold up. Um, for, you know, over the summer, no matter what happens in the short term. So if you were thinking of selling some, you know, front month uh, futures contracts here, uh, some of the front months, maybe May, June, July, um, but we're a little bit worried, you could trade that into a spread and, and sell some of these front months and be buying, let's say, October or November in the, the sort of the belief or the realization that those back months are not really going to go lower even if the front months do. So if vol does come down over summer months, the trade should make money. And if there is a vol pop, well, you've got the protection by only the back months. So I think that's something that will is, is a possibility for those that want to sell um, some of these V-stocks front months, but you know perhaps a bit worried about the macro events. No, that makes a lot of sense. We have discussed that on the program in the past, the ability to maybe uh, leg into some time spreads, given the way the, the term structure is shaping up. Take advantage of those distortions when they give it to you. And we're seeing right now, Gary, obviously, uh, folks are not reticent to sell a little vol in the near term. I, I hate to use the old cliche of sell in May and go away, but that seems to be what they're doing already here, the first week of May, and they're already hitting the bid on vol. So maybe that strategy wouldn't be the worst right now, Gary. Yeah, and I think that the vol selling programs are going to continue. They're not going to be put off here. I think what's going to be very interesting is what it looks like for those vol selling programs as we get closer and closer to October. Um, if if vol, particularly if vol grinds lower over the summer, um, because relative to realized vol, by if we move forward to the end of summer and vol does just grind lower over the summer months, then these you know October, September, October, November, December contracts potentially are going to look very expensive. Vol, you know, implied vol and uh, and the V stocks are going to look ex extremely expensive potentially, and it'll be really interesting. And in, you know, those um, vol selling programs and how they look at that, um, because obviously there's a reason why they're going to look expensive, and uh, it'll be interesting to see whether they continue to sell into it. Now, obviously, the whole world watches the U.S. elections as a volatility event because it impacts the global economy. But interestingly enough, you think maybe this election could have even more reverberations on the European, therefore the v stock side of the fence, than perhaps some other recent elections. Explain that to our listeners. Why do you think that, Gary? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, as we all know, when America sneezes, the whole world catches a cold. And, and so we're all very well aware of that. But generally... U.S. elections are domestic focused, um, and whilst you know the rest of the world, if if the if Wall Street fell, there'd be a move. Um, it wouldn't necessarily U.S. policies wouldn't necessarily affect globally, but but this time they will. Unlike four years ago, eight years ago, um, the Ukraine war is happening, and there's obviously a, a distinct difference in the candidates. Um, and one of them will continue to fund Ukraine, and, and one of them almost certainly won't. And a lot depends on, again, whether he controls the House and is allowed to do what he needs, as well as just winning the presidency. But um, that that is, I think, a, a significant issue for Europe. Um, if the Ukraine funding doesn't continue, um, then the, I think the possibility of an ex escalation of that conflict of uh, of European nations sort of really starting to, to, to band together a bit more towards helping Ukraine is going to increase. 
Um, so I think V stocks futures, uh, you know, and potentially as we get through uh, through the, further through the year, the options as well. Um, even for U.S. accounts, I think are going to be really, really interesting now. Uh, this election in the U.S. has far more uh, um, possibility for move and for vol in Europe than previous ones has because of that reason. Yeah, something we mentioned on the show recently in the past as well, just the uh, potential, it seems like, maybe for some near-term upside might be higher on the V-stocks front than what we're seeing uh, domestically for that exact reason. You're right. Yeah. There is that catalyst yeah. looming there in Ukraine. And in the past, if past is prologue, when we saw spikes driven by events over there, the spike in V-stocks was roughly at least 10 points higher than what we saw in VIX. So, if, yeah, if you're looking for a little bit of upside and maybe – you don't think you're going to see it in the U.S. anytime soon, then they may be something with a little bit more international flavor, dare I say it, Gary, is, is the place to be looking. Now, Gary, when you're looking at trading volatility, you mentioned, you know, your futures time spreads out there in V-Stocks. Is that your chosen vehicle? You like to sling the futures, let's say, in V-Stocks? Are you a, a VIX options guy as well? Do you touch the, the ETPs? When you're looking to trade volatility, what are, what are your chosen vehicles? Um, a range. It depends on the type of trade you want. We started to, we've sort of moved away from some of the ETPs, uh, look more at futures and options, uh, both on uh, VIX, uh, VIX V-stocks, uh, but also outright options as well, right? Because they are different. They offer you different, uh, different possibilities. So depending on the type of trade that we want to structure, that will lend us to move towards one contract or another because they move differently, of course. You know, individual equities move differently to uh, uh, the VIX, for example. And so depending on what we want to do, we'll create a strategy around that. Well, I do have good news for you, Gary, and everyone else who's hanging out in your time zone there, which is obviously <laughs> nearly a full day different than what we're, what we're talking about here in the U.S., is I just came back from the Options Industry Conference last week, talking to a lot of the domestic exchanges here. And it does seem like there's a big push afoot here in the U.S. to uh, cater more to you folks a little bit and try to open up the timeline for trading a little bit more. Obviously, we have the open and close bells. Futures, a little bit of a different story. They tend to trade a little bit longer than the, than the equities do here in the U.S. But it does seem like they have heard your complaints, Gary, and it does seem like maybe, I'm, I won't say full 24-hour trading, but it does seem like maybe some more liquidity may be heading into the hours where you are actually awake, Gary. So does that excite you and maybe a lot of your uh, listeners over there in Australia going forward? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I can't wait to, to, to see what that's like and uh, to get, get involved. Well, Gary, I appreciate you taking some time out of your evening over there <laughs> in Australia to join us here on the International Volatility Review segment. We'll have to get you on on the regular showtime one of these days. We've done it with Australians in the past. It's a challenge, but we can make it work. So maybe we'll get you to beam in on, on the regular show. We'll get a full hour talking all sorts of volatility products with you. It should be kind of fun. But before we go, Gary, if folks are intrigued by anything we talked about here today, maybe some of your time spread strategies, or maybe they just want to reach out and learn more about what you're doing. Where should they go? What should they do? Um, they can have a look. Uh, GaryNorden.com has just some general information about me. Um, Norden Method is uh, futures trading uh, for those that want to take it that way. Uh, I have a free options course on LearnOptions.net as well for those that want just a, a free overview on, on, on options markets. There you go, listeners. Three different URLs uh, to check out. His last name, Norden, N-O-R-D-E-N, if you're looking to spell it there. I appreciate you joining us, Gary, and I look forward to chatting with you again on the show proper sometime in the near future. Enjoyed it greatly, Mark. Thanks very much, and have a great night. The International Volatility Segment is brought to you by Eurex, home of Euro stocks, V stocks, DAX, and the German government bond-based Eurobund, Eurobobble, Euroshots Derivatives. Eurex is the leading European derivatives exchange. Learn more about trading V stocks futures and options, the European volatility benchmark at www.eurex.com slash V stocks. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. 
For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.